as we've indicated, and spent time then uh, after she finished in Jericho at the city of David from 61 to 68. And here is her conclusion. It may seem disappointing that the excavations have discovered none of the buildings of David City. Virtually no area remains in which there's any hope of the finds of the period. The whole of this area must therefore be written off as far as any knowledge of early Jerusalem is concerned. So just forget about it. There's nothing here. Go away. Don't even look. I've looked and it's over. And a lot of people were influenced by that. She died. Uh, and then Yigil Shiloh took over the excavations at the city of David and did a very courageous job. Now he became sick uh, and died an early death. He excavated from 78 to 85 and died before his finds were published, but he refuted Kenyon's work just step by step. He's a, a very courageous person. Jane Cahill is in the process of publishing his work and I have received copies of the original work and uh, it is in the process of being published. In the meantime, uh, since he died, the digs there in the city of David have been taken over by Ronnie Rach and Ellie Sukron, who is my supervisor, one that we've worked with there for a number of years. And these, I think, are very brave men exposing the truth under fierce opposition. Now, Ronnie Rach is more of the politician. He doesn't come out as brashly as Ellie Sukron does, who just tells it like it is <laughs> and has gotten in some trouble, but nevertheless are fighting for the truth. On the other side, opposing what they're doing are men like Israel Finkelstein of Tel Aviv University. He's director of the Institute of Archaeology. And I think you need to know what's being said in opposition to get the context of these investigations. He says, and this was in 2003, almost no signs of monumental building operations. The mythical united monarchy is a literary construct. And from the way he's standing there, you can get an idea of where he's coming from. And that's not an illusion. That's <laughs> he's not a Bible believer, obviously. In fact, he was lecturing here in the United States recently, and his seminar was entitled, What? No Moses? And, of course, that's what he was contending for. His colleague, David Yashiskin, there at Tel Aviv University, made this comment in the same publication. I'm afraid the evidence regarding the magnificent Solomonic capital was not discovered because it is non-existent, not because it's still hidden in the ground. Now that's in Israel where they have some opposition, and there's, <laughs> that may sound like wild and reckless, but you haven't seen wild and reckless till you get over into Europe where they build on that and just really exaggerate. Here's uh, Niles Peter Lamech, the University of Copenhagen. Archaeological data have now definitely confirmed that the empire of David and Solomon never existed. Now, how does archaeological data confirm that something never existed? <laughs> you could confirm something did exist, but maybe you find something tomorrow that confirms it that you haven't found today. And so, anyway, that's, that's another story. Jane Cahill, the successor, uh, at least publisher, of Shiloh's material is uh, likewise a courageous individual who's fighting back. And in Biblical Archaeological Review 2004, she says the most frequently voiced argument by those who challenge the historical existence of the United Monarchy is a supposed, and I'd underscore supposed, lack of archaeological evidence. Now, you don't find the Palace of David with all the cedar planks in this huge structure monumental buildings that were destroyed by Babylonians and by Romans, but still it's appropriate to say it is a supposed lack of evidence. In most cases she continues saying these arguments are either grossly misleading, illogical, disingenuous, or all three. Now you might think, well she's a little over the top here in her response, but let's look at the evidence first before you make that judgment and see if that kind of a statement is just a fact. What's the evidence for this city of David? We're looking here at the Temple Mount and the triangular area just south of the Temple Mount was the area that was occupied by the Jebusites and that's referred to as the city of David. The earliest reference to this city 
is from the Armana letters that date back to the 14th century B.C. This is considerably, I believe, before the Exodus. And here is a letter from the ruler of Jerusalem to the Egyptian pharaoh. And in the inset here, the white uh, boxed letters, you see reference to Jerusalem before the Exodus. After, of course, the Exodus, after David and his people arrived, then we likewise see evidence. This is the way uh, it has been reconstructed. This is the way they believe it appeared at the time David arrived on the scene. We see the irrigation system over on the, the right-hand side, I think the Pool of Siloam down at the bottom. Up at the top, we see the temple that was ultimately built by Solomon and uh, David's palace there below that. The, th the thing that came under first investigation uh, by Cahill and by others was the area that's referred to as the stepped structure that the era is pointing to. Obviously something is going on here. Cahill tried to say it was built by numbers of different people over hundreds of years. Shiloh refuted that by sinking the square shaft that you see up at the top and with that shaft showed that the whole thing was interconnected and interdependent and had to be built at the same time, not over long periods, but was built by the Jebusites and was there at the time David arrived. On the foot of this sloping stepped structure, which is the foundation of obviously something that had to be really big, what needs that kind of a foundation? It's been estimated maybe a six-story building. I mean, well, you wouldn't need that much foundation without it. On the foot, you see later buildings, and this dates back to the end of the first temple period, just before the Babylonians marched in. And especially in, in one of these structures on the foot, the later structures, you have what's referred to as the archive building, for good reason. Important papers were kept here. Well, the papers were burned. They're not available to us. But the papers were sealed with a clay seal stamped by a signet ring or by a stamp of the official that was sending this important document. And this is where a number of them were stored because you find a lot of the seals. And when it's burned, actually the fire uh, fires the clay and helps preserve it. Fifty-one of these stamps, referred to as bully, have been found from this archive building that dates to the time of the end of the first temple period, right at the time when the Babylonians came in and burned it. As we pointed out, these seals are often used to date things, and you see the, the thing that did the impressing on the left-hand side and the stamped clay that's been fired on the right-hand side. Fifty-one of these were found, and as they began to look and read what they said, it was astounding. Here's one from Azariah, the son of Hilkiah, that's mentioned in First Chronicles 9. This was a member of the family of high priests who officiated at the end of the first temple period. Then we read of Jeremiah, the son of Shapan. He's one of the scribes, a high official in the court of Jehoiakim, who was the king at the time that the Babylonians came marching in, reigned at the end of the first temple period. Then Baruch, mentioned in the same verse, if you're familiar with Jeremiah, this was his scribe. He's mentioned some 26 times by Jeremiah, and we have two of Baruch's seals. Actually, one of them has his thumbprint in the back of it, this uh, rather liberal I'd say semi-liberal, <laughs> uh, archaeology book published in 98, Archaeology in the Old Testament, says this lump of clay used to close a papyrus document was sealed by none other than Baruch, the son of Neriah, specifying here Jeremiah 36 and 4. Then the king's son, who gave the orders to seize Jeremiah, to throw him into the pit, Jeremiel, his seal. I mean, these were the kinds of people that would have documents with their stamp on them, and that's what we find in this archive building. Uh, the king's son is there. Actually, of the 51 bully that were found, they attest to 26 mentioned in the Bible. 26 out of the 51 you have reference to. And, of course, the Bible would be describing the officials of the court. And uh, Wow, how do you get... 
greater, more obvious confirmation that the Bible knows what it's talking about when it describes these people. Let's move back in history to the water shaft that's mentioned that Joab went up to conquer the city. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 5. He, whoever goes up, climbs up by the way of the water shaft, defeats the Jebusite. There's been a lot of questions about this and some things that were proposed as the water shaft that, that really weren't. But there was an irrigation system, a spring, we'll look at that in just a moment, in, in, in the city of Jerusalem. And water from that spring ran down the outside edge, and then there were holes that allowed the water to go out into the fields to irrigate. Well, Joab went through one of those holes, came up that water shaft, and then into the city. Today, you can walk right down that water shaft, as my wife is doing here. And uh, if you travel over there, the, the, this is one of the things.